Well, good evening. Delighted and honored to have the opportunity this evening to discuss with you the question, is there evidence for God? And I'm privileged to be doing this with such an eminent scientist as Dr. Krauss. I hope that the debate tonight will be both enlightening as well as entertaining. Now, at one level, it seems to me indisputable that there's evidence for God. To say that there's evidence for some hypothesis is just to say that that hypothesis is more probable, given certain facts, than it would have been without them. That is to say, there's evidence for some hypothesis, H, if the probability of H is greater on the evidence and background information than on the background information alone. That is to say, the probability of H on E and B is greater than the probability of H on B alone. Now, in the case of God, if we let G stand for the hypothesis that God exists, it seems to me indisputable that God's existence is more probable given certain facts, like the origin of the universe, the complex order of the universe, the existence of objective moral values, and so forth, than it would have been without them. That is, the probability of G on uh, E and B is greater than the probability of G on B alone. And I suspect that even most atheists would agree with that statement. So the question, is there evidence for God, isn't really very debatable. Rather, the really interesting question is whether God's existence is more probable than not. That is, is the probability of G on E and B greater than 50%? Now, I'll leave it up to you to assess that probability. My purpose in tonight's debate is much more modest to share with you five pieces of evidence, each of which makes God's existence more probable than it would have been without it. Each of them is, therefore, evidence for God. Together, they provide powerful, cumulative evidence for theism. Number one, then, the existence of contingent beings. The deepest question of philosophy is why do contingent beings exist at all? By a contingent being, I mean a being which exists, but which might not have existed. Examples? Mountains, planets, galaxies, you and me. Such things might not have existed. By contrast, a necessary being is a being which exists by a necessity of its own nature. Its non-existence is impossible. Examples? Many mathematicians believe that numbers and other abstract objects exist in this way. If such entities exist, they just exist necessarily. Now, experience teaches that everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, either in its own nature, if it exists necessarily, or in an external cause, if it exists contingently. So, what about the universe? Well, by the universe, I mean all of space-time reality, not just our observable portion of it. What is the explanation of its existence? Well, since the universe is contingent in its existence, the explanation of the universe must be found in an external cause, which exists beyond time and space by a necessity of its own nature. Now, what could that be? Well, there are only two kinds of things that could fit that description. Either abstract objects, like numbers, or God. But abstract objects don't stand in causal relations. The number seven, for example, has no effect upon anything. And therefore, it follows that the most plausible explanation of the universe is God. Hence, the existence of contingent beings makes God's existence more probable than it would have been without them. Although I've presented this reasoning inductively, we can also put it in the form of a deductive argument. Premise one, everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, either in its own nature or in an external cause. Two, the universe exists. Three, if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God from which it follows logically for, therefore, 
the explanation of the universe is God. Thus the explanation for the existence of contingent beings is to be found in God. Number two, the origin of the universe. My first argument is consistent with the assumption that the universe is beginningless or eternal in the past. But is it? There are good reasons, both philosophically and scientifically, to doubt that the universe is beginningless. Philosophically, the idea of an eternal past seems absurd. Just think about it. If the universe never had a beginning, that means that the series of uh, past events goes back to infinity, that the number of events in the past history of the universe is infinite. But mathematicians recognize that the existence of an actually infinite number of things leads to self-contradictions. For example, what is infinity minus infinity? Well, mathematically, you get self-contradictory answers. This shows that infinity is just an idea in your mind, not something that exists in reality. But that entails that since past events are not just ideas but are real, the number of past events must be finite. Therefore, the series of past events can't go back forever. Rather, the universe must have begun to exist. This philosophical conclusion has been confirmed by remarkable discoveries in astronomy and astrophysics. We now have pretty strong evidence that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning a finite time ago. In 2003, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin we're able to prove that any universe which has, on average, been expanding throughout its history cannot be infinite in the past, but must have a past space-time boundary. What makes their proof so powerful is that it holds regardless of the physical description of the very early universe. Because we can't yet provide a physical description of the first split second of the universe, this brief moment has been fertile ground for speculations. But the bord guth vilenkin theorem is independent of the physical description of that moment. Their theorem implies that the quantum vacuum state out of which our material state may have evolved, which some scientific popularizations have misleadingly and inaccurately referred to as nothing, cannot be eternal in the past but must have a beginning, even if our universe is just a tiny part of a much grander multiverse composed of many universes, their theorem requires that the multiverse itself must have a beginning. Speculative theories such as pre-Big Bang inflationary scenarios have been crafted to try to avoid this absolute beginning, but none of these theories has succeeded in restoring an eternal past. At most, they just push the beginning back a step. But then the question inevitably arises, why did the universe come into being? What brought the vacuum state into existence? Well, unless you're willing to say that the universe just popped into being, uncaused, out of absolute non-being, there must be a transcendent cause beyond space and time which created the universe. Clearly, then, God's existence is more probable, given the beginning of the universe, than it would have been without it. We can also formulate this reasoning in the form of a deductive argument. One, everything that begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist, from which it follows logically that three, therefore, the universe has a cause. And again, as we've seen, the best candidate for such a transcendent cause is God. Number three, the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. In recent decades, scientists have been stunned by the discovery that the initial conditions of our universe were fine-tuned for the existence of intelligent agents with a precision and delicacy that literally defy human comprehension. This fine-tuning is of two sorts. 
First, when the laws of nature are given mathematical expression, you find appearing in them certain constants, like the gravitational constant. These constants are not determined by the laws of nature. Second, in addition to these constants, there are certain arbitrary quantities, which are just put in as initial conditions on which the laws of nature operate. For example, the amount of entropy in the very early universe. Now, all of these constants and quantities fall into an extraordinarily narrow range of life-permitting values. Were these constants or quantities to be altered by even a hair's breadth, the life-permitting balance would be destroyed and life would not exist. We now know that life-prohibiting universes are incomprehensibly more probable than any life-permitting universe. Now, there are three possible explanations of this extraordinary fine-tuning. Physical necessity, chance, or design. Now, it can't be due to physical necessity because, as I've said, the constants and quantities are independent of the laws of nature. So, maybe the fine-tuning is due to chance. After all, highly improbable events happen every day. But what serves to distinguish purely chance events from design is not simply high improbability, but also the presence of an independently given pattern to which the event conforms. For example, in the movie Contact, scientists are able to distinguish a signal from outer space from random noise, not simply due to its high improbability, but because of its conformity to the pattern of the prime numbers. The fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent agents exhibits just that combination of incomprehensible improbability and conformity to an independently given pattern that are the earmarks of design. So, again, God's existence is clearly more probable, given the fine-tuning of the universe, than it would have been without it. We can also formulate this reasoning into a simple deductive argument. Premise one, the fine-tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Two, it is not due to physical necessity or chance, from which it follows logically three, therefore it is due to design. Thus the fine-tuning of the universe implies the existence of a designer of the cosmos. Number four, objective moral values and duties in the world. By objective moral values, I mean moral values which are valid and binding whether anyone believes in them or not. Many theists and atheists agree that if God does not exist, then moral values are not objective in this sense. For example, Michael Roos, an agnostic philosopher of science, asserts, morality is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and feet and teeth. Considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, ethics is illusory. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory. On a naturalistic view, moral values are just the byproduct of biological evolution and social conditioning. Just as a troop of baboons exhibit cooperative and even self-sacrificial behavior because natural selection has determined it to be advantageous in the struggle for survival, so their primate cousins, Homo sapiens, have uh, evolved a sort of similar behavior for the same reason. As a result of sociobiological pressures, there has evolved among Homo sapiens a sort of herd morality that functions well in the perpetuation of our species. But on the atheistic view, there doesn't seem to be anything about this morality that makes it objectively binding and true. But the problem is that objective moral values and duties plausibly do exist. In moral experience, we apprehend a realm of moral values and duties that impose themselves upon us. There's no more reason to deny the objective reality of moral values than the objective reality of the physical world. 
actions like rape, cruelty, and child abuse aren't just socially unacceptable behavior. They're moral abominations. Some things, at least, are really wrong. Michael Roos himself admits, and I quote, the man who says it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. Some things, at least, are really wrong. But in that case, the probability of God's existence is 1.0. We can formulate this reasoning as follows. One, if God did not exist, objective moral values and duties would not exist. Two, objective moral values and duties do exist, from which it follows logically and inescapably that three, therefore, God exists. Number five, the historical facts concerning Jesus of Nazareth. The historical person Jesus of Nazareth was a remarkable individual. Historians have reached something of a consensus that the historical Jesus came on the scene with an unprecedented sense of divine authority, the authority to stand and speak in God's place. He claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had come, and as visible demonstrations of this fact, he carried out a ministry of miracle working and exorcisms. But the supreme confirmation of his claim was his resurrection from the dead. If Jesus really did rise from the dead, then it would seem that we have a divine miracle on our hands, and thus evidence for the existence of God. Now, most people probably think that the resurrection of Jesus is something you just believe in by faith or not. But there are actually three facts recognized by the majority of New Testament historians today, which I believe are best explained by Jesus' resurrection. Fact number one, on the Sunday after his crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. According to Jakob Kramer, an Austrian specialist, by far most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. Fact number two, on separate occasions, different individuals and groups saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. According to the prominent New Testament critic Gerhard Ludemann, it may be taken as historically certain that the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. These appearances were witnessed not only by believers, but also by unbelievers, skeptics, and even enemies. Finally, fact number three, the original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus, despite having every predisposition to the contrary. Jews had no belief in a defeated and dying Messiah, and Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead to glory and immortality before the end of the world. Nevertheless, the original disciples came to believe so strongly that God had raised Jesus from the dead that they were willing to die for the truth of that belief. N.T. Wright, an eminent New Testament scholar, concludes, that is why, as a historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. Naturalistic attempts to explain these three great facts, like the disciples stole the body, or Jesus wasn't really dead, have been universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. The simple fact is there just is no plausible naturalistic explanation of these facts. And therefore, it seems to me the Christian is amply justified in believing that the best explanation of the evidence is that Jesus rose from the dead and was who he claimed to be. But that entails that God exists. Thus, we have a good inductive argument for the existence of God based on the resurrection of Jesus. In summary, then, we've looked at five lines of evidence, each of which makes God's existence more probable than it would have been without them. God's existence is obviously more probable, given these facts, than it would have been in their absence. They, therefore, constitute evidence for God. 
Indeed, I think that cumulative force makes God's existence very much more probable. But that is an assessment which each one of us will have to make for himself. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Dr. Krauss? Hi there. Oh, good. That's up. Can you hear me? Good. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Uh, first, I want to thank Mark Stevens and the Campus Crusade for Christ, who have been remarkably hospitable and, and gracious to me uh, during the short time I've been here, and I really appreciate everything they've done. Uh, I do, I, profess, Dr. Craig is a, uh, is a professional debater. I'm not. I don't like debates, actually. I find them combative and not a good way to actually elucidate information and knowledge. But I agreed to come anyway. Um, some people have said I'm brave. Uh, some people I know are feeling I'm foolhardy. Uh, but actually, I want to I want to compliment Dr. Craig for his bravery tonight, um, because unlike the other debates I've seen him talk in, which have to do with the existence of God, which this debate, by the way, doesn't have to do with, I'm not here to disprove the existence of God in any way. I think that's kind of a futile and useless activity, something I wouldn't waste my time on. Uh, this is a debate, is there evidence for God? And that, therefore, makes it quite different in spirit. It's not a debate about philosophy, which is Dr. Craig's area of expertise, and I would not come to a debate to talk about semiotics or transubstantiation, because I recognize um, that I would not be probably competent to talk about that. But Dr. Craig came here to talk about evidence, which is uh, I take to be empirical and scientific, and Dr. Craig is not a scientist, as he has demonstrated several times in the last few minutes. Uh, the, onus, the important thing about this debate also is that the onus is, not, the onus is on Dr. Craig to demonstrate evidence for God. I'm, uh, the onus is not on me to disprove anything. The onus is on Dr. Craig to demonstrate evidence, and then I, I guess I'm here to talk about whether I view that as evidence. And uh, that's very different, I think, in spirit than, than a number of the other debates that Dr. Craig has been involved in. And, and I, I, I congratulate him for his bravery to do that, or maybe foolhardiness, we'll see. Um, now, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And in fact, uh, I, uh, I, I, I will get to the fact that Dr. Claims, um, Dr. Craig's claim for what evidence is is not at all what we use in science nowadays. Uh, it doesn't relate at all to what we use in science. But uh, one could imagine, I mean, there's no more extraordinary claim, I think, than the fact that there is a divine, infinitely powerful intelligence that exists, that creates the universe, and then largely disappears. And that, except maybe in a few places making itself manifest to Bronze Age peasants before YouTube or anything else that could record the evidence. Not only that, I should point out that it is a far cry from claiming that there may be cosmological arguments for the existence of a divine intelligence. There's no logical connection between that and the God that Dr. Craig has talked about who shows great interest in the, in the personal affairs of human beings roughly a million years after they were uh, uh, evolved. And um, uh, in fact, a personal God that Dr. Craig happens to believe in, but not a personal God that other people have to believe in. There's no logical connection between a God who, create, who might, a divine intelligence that might create the universe, and Christ. There's not, not, nothing at all. Now, it would be easy to have evidence for God. If the, if the stars rearranged themselves tonight, and, set, and I looked up tonight, and saw something, well, not here, but in a place where there was, you can see the stars, in Arizona, say. And I looked up tonight in the star, and I saw the stars rearrange themselves, say, I am here. Gee, that's pretty interesting evidence. And in fact, when we talk about evidence, the only evidence you can have for God is really the miraculous evidence. Because the existence of God implies something that is supernatural, something beyond that which can be explained by physical theory. So if you're going to have evidence for God, it has to be Miraculous evidence. Now, I'm not a, also not a huge fan of philosophy, but I thought I would quote a philosopher in deference to Dr. Craig, and that's David Hume, who said, who defined a miracle to be the following. No testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood 
would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavors to establish. So if you're claiming you have evidence for a miracle, the fact that that evidence is false has to be even stranger than the evidence itself. And of course, that doesn't apply to anything Dr. Craig has talked about, as I'll try and describe. It's a tr therefore, in fact, the kind of evidence that Dr. Craig would need to show is incredibly high. He has to jump a huge hurdle. The criterion that we should use to judge his evidence for this extraordinary claim, this miraculous claim, I repeat, this miraculous claim, you have to ask yourself, is the possibility that that claim is false more miraculous than the claim itself? And I think if you're serious about that logic, you'll find that in every case that he's mentioned, it's, it's not the case. Now, the other thing that Dr. Craig has talked about is logic. And the interesting thing about the universe is it's not logical. At least it's not classically logical. That's one of the great things about science. It's taught us that the universe is the way it is, whether we like it or not. And much of what Dr. Craig has talked about, and we'll talk about again tonight, is the fact that he doesn't like certain ideas. He doesn't like the idea of infinity, he doesn't like the idea of beginning, he doesn't like the idea of chance. And in fact, it doesn't make sense to him. He doesn't, even, he doesn't like a universe in which morality is defined as allowing rape. Doesn't make sense to him. But the point is, if we, we if we continue to rely on our understanding of the universe, on Aristotelian logic, on classical logic, about what we think is sensible, we would still be living in a world where heavier objects, we think, fall faster than light objects because they're heavier, as Aristotle used to think, instead of doing the experiment to check it out. We cannot rely on what we perceive to be sensible. We have to rely on what the universe tells us is sensible. What we have to do is force our beliefs to conform to the evidence of reality rather than the other way around. And the, the universe just simply isn't sensible. Uh, let me, I, I think I have an example. I can't, I, and here's, I have two quotes from Richard Feynman because I just wrote a book about him, which I hope you all buy. But, um, uh, but you know, th this is really important. This is one of the key, one of the reasons I'm a scientist is that crazy ideas end up not being crazy. If you, if the, if you see something that's, that seems impossible, but it happens, the onus is in you to understand why and to force your, your thinking to conform to that. And it's been one of the great pleasures of doing 20th and 21st century physics that we've been able to do that in many areas from quantum mechanics to relativity. And, and this idea that something that looks completely paradoxical at first, if analyzed to completion in all its details and in all experimental situations, may in fact be paradoxical, is a profound, may in fact not be paradoxical, I should say, is in fact of profound, profound importance. We can't just say we don't like something and therefore God exists, which is essentially, as far as I can tell, behind every single one of Dr. Craig's statements that he made tonight. And we'll have a chance, I hope, to go over some of them. But let, get, let me give you an example. You see, I kind of figured I'm not going to change many minds. So I'm an educator, and I figured I'd teach you a little quantum mechanics. Okay? Um, because it gives you a sense of how strange and crazy the world is. So if I have a, there's a famous experiment that's been performed. If I have a wall with two slits and I have bullets that I shoot through a gun, and I hope no one here has one, um, uh, the, the, uh, through those, and I just shoot it randomly through those two slits, then the bullet will go in one place or it'll, it'll go in another place. Oops, I got the wrong thing there, but that's okay. We can leave that there for a second. So what you'll expect to see in the slits is either a lot of holes there and a lot of holes there and nothing else. Okay. If you shoot a wave through two slits, and some of you may have been subjected to this in physics classes, you'll find something very different. The wave, in fact, will go through both slits, interfere with, with, with itself, and create what's called an interference pattern. If you've ever seen two waves come together in the ocean, you see these beautiful patterns of ripples that are just spectacular to see, and it's one of the great joys of physics to see them. But the amazing thing is that when we shoot electrons, particles, at two slits, what pattern do we see? We see exactly the same pattern we would see with waves. Now that's crazy, because electrons are particles. So you say, well, maybe they're waves. But no, let's see. I don't believe they're waves, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a light at, right here at the slits, and I'm going to check where each electron goes through. 
because I want because right now it looks in order to create this pattern, the only way you can create that pattern is if the electron went through both slits at the same time. That's insane. It's like infinity. Okay? So that, that's insane. So I put a light there and I shine it. What happens? I see each electron goes through only one slit or the other. Aha! I proved that it doesn't go through both. But then when I look at the pattern, the pattern's different. If I shine the light and look at the electron, I just see those two, two lines that I talked about earlier, right here and here. If I don't shine the light on the electron, the pattern is different. If I don't shine the light on the electron, we now know the electron goes through both slits at the same time. It does something classically impossible. And when we saw that, we didn't say, you know what, God exists. What we said is, well, maybe the laws of nature are stranger than we thought, and maybe we better figure out how things behave so we can explain and predict things. And the, world, the universe is stranger than you think in almost every way. In fact, I cannot resist this because Dr. Craig mentioned it. Sorry, I'm, I'm not going to go all the way down, I promise. <laughs> but I, I wore a t-shirt because it was cold. And I can't resist. It's worth a thousand words, so it's okay. Okay. <laughs> two plus two equals five, my t-shirt says, for extremely large values of two. Now that's extremely important because, in fact, classical logic, such as two plus two equals five, uh, is four, uh, can equal five, is wrong. Mathematicians and physicists know that for extremely large values of numbers, you have to change the rules. And in fact, let's go to some of the things Dr. Craig talked about. In fact, the existence of infinity, which he talked about, which is self-contradictory, is not self-contradictory at all. Mathematicians know precisely how to deal with infinity. So do physicists. We rely on infinities. In fact, there's a field of mathematics called complex variables, which is the basis of much of modern physics, from electromagnetism to quantum mechanics and beyond, where, in fact, we learn how to deal with infinity. We, without the infinities, we couldn't do the physics. We know how to sum infinite series because we can do complex analysis. Mathematicians have taught us how. It's strange and very unappetizing. And, and in fact, you can sum things that look ridiculous. For example, if you sum the series 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 to infinity, what's the answer? Minus 1 12. You don't like it? Too bad. The mathematics is consistent if we assign that. The world is the way it is, whether we like it or not. So let's talk about the five pieces of evidence that, that Dr. Gray talked about. The existence of contingent beings. Beings that didn't have to exist. Well, accidents happen all the time. Many things happen that are just accidental. We assign significance. We are hardwired to want to believe. That's very important. We all want to believe in a host of things. We all have to convince ourselves of 10 impossible things before breakfast in order to get up in the morning. That we like school, or we love the person in the, in the bed next to us, or something. It's, the way, it's what we need as human beings to exist. We want to believe, we need to believe, but accidents sometimes happen. You can, for example, have a million dreams over a million nights, but let's pretend it's not a million, let's just say it's a thousand nights, that are nonsensical. One night, you dream that your friend is going to break their arm. Next day, your friend breaks their leg. Aha! Something significant. But of course, you forget all the times your dreams were nonsensical. Again, Richard Feynman used to go up to people and say, you, you know what happened to me? You won't believe what happened to me today. You just won't believe it. You just won't believe it. You say, what? You say, absolutely nothing. Okay, because most of the time when things happen, we don't, they're not significant, but we ascribe significance to them. Contingent things happen all the time without necessarily having a cause, but even if they do have a cause, 
If we don't understand the cause, it doesn't mean that God exists. It seemed to me that, that, that Dr. Craig's first example is a characteristic example of God in the gaps. We don't know all the processes which led to the existence of human beings, therefore God exists. Well, that's just an awful excuse for God. Because that God of the gaps argument risks God disappearing when we discover the cause. And we discover the cause is simply physical. We now know, in fact, getting to his origin of the universe and also whether the universe is contingent or not, the universe, Dr. Craig argued that we know the universe isn't contingent, it had to exist. How does he know that? I don't know that. How do we know that? We don't know the answer. It's fine not to know the answer. There's nothing wrong with not knowing the answer. In fact, not knowing the answer is exciting because it means there's a lot to learn. To argue that from some basic principle, we know the universe had to exist, is, is myopic in the extreme. Or perhaps, in my opinion, intellectually lazy. Instead of saying, let's see, let's go out and try and spend our lives trying to understand what processes might have caused it to exist, and whether it might not have existed, and whether there may be many universes, I will just make the assumption, because I like it. Well, God of the gaps is not, a good, argue, not good evidence for, for God. It's not also good evidence for sound thinking. The origin of the universe, again, coming back to Dr. Craig's argument, that it, it can't be eternal. Well, we do know, in fact, Dr. Craig said there's good evidence for a Big Bang. Well, there's more than good evidence for a Big Bang. We know a Big Bang happened. The Big Bang is a fact. It happened 13.72 billion years ago, and the fact that we can say so to four decimal places is one of the most remarkable feats of modern science that we should all herald. And, and, and used to, uh, to uh, and exalt as an example of how remarkable it is to be a human being who could think. These are the fact that we now here sitting in the middle of no place, in the middle of a random, around a random star, in the middle of a random galaxy, in the middle of a universe of 400 billion galaxies, a universe which is made, in fact, which the galaxies and the stars are largely irrelevant. And the human beings and the aliens that live on those stars are largely irrelevant. We have now learned that the mass of the universe well, one, less than 1% 1 of the universe is made up of everything we can see. All the stars, all the galaxies, all the planets, everything is a bit of pos cosmic pollution in a universe made up of dark matter and dark energy. Things which are invisible, but we know exist because we can measure them, because we can falsify them. That's the other aspect of evidence. Evidence must be falsifiable. I could argue that... Dr. Craig has three legs. I see he has three legs right here. Oh, but whenever he stands up and you look at him, he only has two. It One disappears. Okay? Now, that's not falsifiable evidence. I could argue, I could argue that we, don't ex we didn't exist less than five seconds ago. How can you prove me wrong? I could argue that God created the universe four and a half seconds ago with all of us sitting here believing we heard Dr. Craig. There's no way I could disprove that. And there's no way I would want to try and disprove it, because it's not falsifiable. It's not, in a scientific sense, it's not evidence. Now, actually, Dr. Craig, when he talked about Alan Guth, was, of course, wrong. Um, the actual first person to talk about uh, the fact that the universe had to begin at a finite time in a singularity is Stephen Hawking, um, who made some singularity theorems with Roger Penrose. But, the interesting thing is Stephen Hawking has also argued, as in fact we now know given quantum gravity, that universes can spontaneously appear. In fact, one of the things about quantum, quantum mechanics is nothing, not only can nothing become something, nothing always becomes something. Nothing is unstable. Nothing will always produce something in quantum mechanics. And if you apply quantum mechanics to gravity, you can show that it's possible that space and time themselves can come into existence when nothing existed before. So that's not a problem. Now, in fact, what Guth has argued is, in fact, that a theorem that he, that uh, 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 a theory that he postulated to explain the data, not because he wanted to answer some metaphysical question about whether God existed or not, a theorem that he made to explain the data called inflation actually predicts essentially an infinite number of universes in an eternal multiverse that exists for all time and for all space. It's eternal. It didn't have a beginning. We don't know if it had a cause, but it doesn't matter. Because our universe could spontaneously appear out of that multiverse. 
So the idea of a first cause is not relevant. I, I think I'll, I, I, I'll go to Jesus of Nazareth with that, with, later but, and fine-tuning, where, where in fact Dr. Craig is completely wrong. The universe is not fine-tuned for life. No scientist says the universe is fine-tuned for human life. That is an incorrect statement. Let me just go to at last his, his morality argument. We don't know if there's an objective morality. There may or may not be. That's an interesting question. But whether there is or not, it doesn't apply God. For example, we talked about rape. If God sets subjective morality, if God decided that raping two-year-old girls was okay, would it be okay? Most of you, I think, would say no. Why would it be okay? Because it's not moral. But if it's not moral, then God didn't have the choice. It's not God that chose what's moral. And therefore, if morality is based on what's rational, then why not get rid of the middleman and get rid of God? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Krauss.